I'm your host. How are you? So what do you think so far this year? Huh? Mm-hmm. Pretty nice podcast. The whole David Payne thing was quite a nice little get. Very exciting. Got me lots of uh, exposure with the high ups, the higher ups, the highest ups. You know, that maybe this other ups nonetheless. That's good. Wow. The numbers are crazy, too. I'm so glad you're here. It's been uh, kind of amazing. So I have um, I have two stories to tell you before we go much further. Uh, one is I got an email the other day. <laughs> I don't even know what to say about this. Um, yesterday, yeah, it would have been yesterday. Yeah, it would have been. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yesterday, we are the thirty-second most listened to podcast, um, in Norway. Yes, it's true. I know. I don't know who the thirty-one other ones are, but I'm hoping they're super Norwegian. And then there's ours. <laughs> I don't I don't really know what to do with that data, actually. It's kind of an interesting thing to get in the mail, but I was glad to get it. That's kind of a nice thing to get. But that's not the, I mean, that's fun to talk about, and I'm sure that's a, I mean, I'm honored. Absolutely no question about it. But that leads me to sort of the tie-in for today's story. Today's, so today's podcast is going to be fun. We're going to talk to Sam Goodman. If you don't know Sam Goodman, you're about to learn all about him. This is a two-for-one podcast because I had to record it twice because for the first time in the history of the podcast, um, the software ate an interview. So we did a really nice interview, and then Sam was taking me to the airport, and the software ate it or died or blue screen of death or whatever it is. So we recorded it in the car on the way there. You'll you'll know. <laughs> There's no – you can't really hide that, far, that part. Um, but so Sam dumped me off at the airport. So I get off the airport. And I've got all this podcast crap in my briefcase, not in my suitcase, in my briefcase, because we've just recorded a podcast. We're going to, you know, all the stuff I just told you. So I go through airline security and I help a person in front of me and I talk to a lady beside me and then I put my, my suitcase up on the conveyor belt. Then I put my briefcase up on the conveyor belt and I, I go through the magnetometer thing, the metal detector thing, and I'm sitting on the other side. And pretty soon, the person running the x-ray machine says, okay, who's the genius that puts so much stuff in their bag? And uh, the bag rolls out, and it's mine. And I say to them, you don't get to be the judge of what I put in my bag. And the lady said, you put too much stuff in there, and I absolutely am the judge of it. And because you put so much stuff in there, I'm going to have to unload it all. So she stops, she gets up, she grabs my bag, she takes it on the other side, she gets one of those bins, and she basically dumps my briefcase out into a bin and then puts my briefcase on. Well, so now it goes through the x-ray part of the machine one more time, and she leaves the the uh, the people that I was uh, uh, working with, giving a speech for, um, having, having some fun with, they had brought in, it was in Phoenix, and they had brought in lunch, and lunch had these big sugar cookies about the size of a, like a softball. I mean, they're, they're flat, so they're not round. I wish they were round like a softball. And I'd put a sugar cookie in a Ziploc bag, and I'd put it in my briefcase, and everything goes through the x-ray. And sure enough, the bin full of crap that she dumped out makes it all the way through. But my bag gets pulled off, and now I'm being taught a lesson. And it's so obvious that she's going to run me through secondary screening because I made a comment about her not being the the judge of what gets to go in my bag. So we go through secondary screening and um, there's no other people there. So I wait a really long time and my bag's the only bag on the secondary screening conveyor. And I wait longer and I'm standing kind of by where the, the bosses all sit uh, in this little count, this little raised counter. So I get up to this lady who's clearly a manager. And I say, Hey, can I get some screening on the TSA pre-check line? And the lady looks at me and she said, I'm busy. Just wait. So I turned around and walked away and waited and nobody came. Nobody came. And the poor lady's working alone and she's already yelled at me. So I go back to the supervisor and I say, can I get some help here? 
And the lady said, sir, it looks like you've got some kind of problem because you keep bothering me and I'm busy. And uh, she gets up and she walks towards my bag. And this man comes, but the man is their manager because he's dressed in civilian clothes. And he does this, um, I don't know, kind of this malicious politeness and tells me that I need to allow this lady to do her job. So I said, well, um, near as I can tell, her job is screening my bag. That's your job. And they uh, screen my bag, and they bring over a guy, and uh, he's really maliciously polite. I mean, just he's mean. And he digs through my bag, and he finds a cookie. And he said, what is this organic mass? And I said, it's called a cookie, and it's legal, and you can fly with them. And it's not bad. It's a good thing. And he said, you can't have organic mass next to your computer, sir. And I said, it's a cookie. No matter what you want to call it, it's a cookie. And he puts everything away, and uh, he says, you're free to go. So I put my stuff back in my bag, and I'm walking by that desk where that lady was. And that lady had told me in the middle of this process that she might help me. Might help me. That's the key word there, might help me. So the, the maliciously polite boss guy um, really aggressive. He was standing there and I said, can I talk to you a moment? He goes, sir, what is your problem now? Just like that. And I said, well, I'll tell you what my problem is now. The problem now is that your screener said they might help me. And near as I could tell, might is really a problem. And he said, sir, we're done with you. Please enjoy your flight. And I said, but I'm not done with you. And he said, sir, I am finished talking to you now please enjoy your flight. And I said, I don't think you get to say might. I said, in fact, um, TSA pretext, you charge me. He goes, and he said, that's where you're wrong, sir. The government does not make money off you. We can only tax you. TSA pretext is free. And I said, well, you charge me. That pays for your screening, sir. I said, okay, but it still is a charge for me. And he gets super, super, super maliciously complied. And he stands in my face and he says, I'm done talking to you, sir. Have a pleasant day. Enjoy your flight. So I just stand there. And he said, I'm finished. And I said, okay, what's your name? He said, my name is Mr. Stewart. You need to have a pleasant day, sir. And then he just walks away. So here's my Here's my take on that. So I didn't get arrested or anything. I, I don't think I did anything bad. I mean, near as I could tell, you could carry a cookie, and they don't get to tell you how much too much stuff is, right? Because near as I can tell, I don't know how you feel about your briefcase, but if it, fits in, if it fits in my briefcase, it's not too much stuff. If it doesn't fit in my briefcase, that then qualifies as too much stuff. And I didn't really have I mean, everything was in a nice little, little like, zippered cube container. It was pretty well contained. But this idea of being maliciously polite made me instantly think about malicious compliance, and it made me think about rule following. And the crazy thing about this is that when, when, when you posture yourself immediately with their right and I'm wrong, which is exactly what they postured themselves at, and they went from zero to angry just immediately. I mean, I, I didn't really do anything other than ask for somebody to screen the bag. But it escalated so fast, and it was so crazy, and it was really kind of unsafe and certainly unsettling. And what's amazing to me is I actually think that makes them weaker and less impressive and less honorable and less followable. And you can kind of see almost immediately this whole push that we do about thinking of the worker not as the problem, but as really the problem solver and recognizing expertise exists at every part of the system. So users who use TSA have expertise that screeners who run TSA don't have. They just don't have, and it's, and it's that different perception, but boy, I got to tell you guys, I, it's, I don't know if it's because I just attract it probably, or if, I fly so much I just get exposed to it, but it's 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 really got me to a point where it's almost I, that was really uncomfortable and c- kind of bad. 
And if you go to Phoenix, look for Mr. Stewart because he is one of the least professional, least pleasant people I think I've ever experienced. And he works for me. I mean, near as I can tell, he's, he's, he's an employee of the federal government. And I'm the user of that service. And he's the provider of that service. And I know it gets kind of fuzzy around that because, you know, they're providing security. But I don't know. It was kind of crazy. But everything ended fine. Got on the plane. No police chased me. Made it home. So there you go. That's, I mean, that's the story. Take it for what it's worth. But it's crazy to think about it that way, which kind of leads me into what we're going to talk about today. This podcast today, I think you're really going to vibe on. It's a, it's a fun podcast. It's a really a good podcast. You're going to enjoy it. It's really an interesting conversation with Sam. And we're going to talk just, just basically about where Sam, Sam is. So Sam's a practitioner. And uh, he, he's really become quite fixated on sort of understanding and becoming really proficient in kind of managing safety forward, the safety in kind of the new view. And I can't wait for you to hear hear the conversation. Sam, he's a really good guy. So this is us driving through Phoenix to get to the airport. And just know the entire time you hear this, I have a giant cookie in my briefcase just waiting to be eaten. So without any further ado, sit back and relax. Here's Sam Goodman and uh, and myself and you. All three of us are going to be listening to a conversation on safety at the applied point of an organization. Take it away, you guys. Well, I'm Sam Goodman. Um, I work for a major utility in Southwest in Arizona. Um, I'm a recovering safety professional, as I kind of describe myself. And um, I say that because I'm, I'm mostly into human organization performance um, where I work. And beyond that, I, I host a podcast in and around that subject and, and do all kinds of stuff with that. So. And what's the, what's the podcast called? It's actually called The Hot Nerd. So is that a term of endearment or an insult? Um, I, I think it really started as an insult, but, <laughs> but, but I took that, it kind of ran with it, and uh, yeah, it's, it's been great. I, I just kind of took that when it kind of came out, and that's it yeah, for sure. I'm definitely a nerd. I'll gladly, gladly take that term. <laughs> You'll take the term nerd. So really the question I should probably ask you is what does recovering safety professional mean? What do you mean? Well, for me, you know, I kind of grew up in that space, um, maintenance and construction contractors, large contractors. And I really grew up in a really heavily uh, or heavy traditional safety kind of atmosphere in and around that zero stuff and kind of everything operating under this banner of zero and the pyramids and kind of all this stuff that kind of goes along with it. So when I really discovered human and organizational performance, um, it kind of blew my mind. It was the it was really the stuff we've been trying to say for a really long time. Um, and I kind of found myself there. Uh, a colleague of mine had actually dropped a, dropped a book on my desk and said, hey, I think you kind of want to should read this. And it was actually Safety Differently by, by Tecker. And so I started diving into that. And as I said, it, it blew my mind. It really set me on a different course. And I was going, wow, this, this completely makes sense. This is the stuff that we've been trying to tell folks for a very long time. So, um, yeah, it was. that's what I mean by recovering is it's really just a different, different thought of, of where we're going. That's such an interesting way to start the journey because starting with, with safety differently is like reading. It's like, it's like starting a meal in the middle of it. Right, right, right. So, yeah, and so that was a really interesting book for me to, to jump into. Um, from there, I really dove into um, pre-accident investigations. So that was that was the next one that I really got into. Um, and then from there, it really just it just grew. I mean, my list was just constantly growing and it continues to grow. Um, as I mentioned, I mean, where I'm at now, I'm really digging into um, normal access by Perot. So I mean, just the, the list just continues to grow and my list is, is at the point where it's so long that I don't know if, I, if I'll ever actually catch up to reading all the stuff that I hope to, hope to read. Which kind of is depressing, but it's kind of cool. Have you read like James Reason? Any of the that kind of stuff? So I've, I've dove into a little bit of Reason stuff. Yeah, most of most of the stuff I've really been digging into is is a lot of your stuff, a lot of Decker stuff. Um, more recently, uh, with my current organization, I mean, we're really starting to dig into some of the Hollenagel stuff and some of the other pieces around that too. So, um, yeah, but uh, it's really been a little bit of everything. Which is kind what of- would you recommend to? People are just starting the journey. I mean, how would how would you say to start reading if they wanted to read? So for me, I, I did I did kind of start in the middle, and uh, some folks do kind of start a little backwards on the reading. 
Um, for me, it would really start with pre-accident investigations. I think that's a super great place to start. Um, from there, diving into uh, the Five Principles book is, is, again, just great stuff. And really, um, the Field Guide to Understanding Human Error by Decker. I, if I had to pick a list of books, three, three books for for folks to read, if I had a mandatory reading list, I think that would be it. That would, that would be a really good start for folks. What do you like about the Field Guide? I think for me, it just kind of laid stuff out in a kind of way that made sense. It was actually usable. It was something that you could actually take out and use. And it really just painted this in a completely different picture than where we had kind of originally been or originally thought. So, How's your organization moving? What are you guys learning as you kind of go through this change organizationally? Because you guys are right in the thick of it, man. You're right in the middle. Yeah, so we're, we're really learning. I think the bigger lesson that we've learned is to really listen. I think that's, that's probably probably the bigger shift for us is we went from trying to tell workers how to do things really to this big shift and asking workers what they need and really trying to listen and back that up kind of giving workers what they need so it's, it is it's a big shift for us how's it manifested what's it look like um, at the pointier end of things it's really it's really manifested out into learning teams so learning teams have been probably the most amazing tool <laughs> that we could ask for um, because we're using them around practically everything right now. I mean, any process, any system, any procedure that, that we know needs an element of betterment or has friction points or just kind of has some not so great stuff. Um, we're kind of doing learning teams. We're asking folks that actually have to use new things to help us figure out what they look like. And that's pretty cool. And then obviously on the, the kind of post not so great thing happening, we're using them as a tool to learn and, and grow betterment around that. So it's, it's pretty neat. How, how, how does that... I mean, how did you manifest those? Not how do you do learning teams. Right. That's another podcast. But how did you get them out as a tool in your organization? Well, it really started with the conversations. So we, we really started with um, really in and around the conversations around what this different version of safety looks like. So we did the traditional stuff for a really long time, as most organizations do, right? We would have something not so great happen. Uh, we would investigate it thoroughly and we would throw out some corrective actions and then it wouldn't really fix a lot <laughs> of anything, right? We, we, we have tons of corrective actions that didn't really do a lot. Um, so recognizing that, you know, we kind of switched that over to, you know, maybe we need to ask the people that actually experience this stuff how to fix this stuff. We started to kind of in line with, with those the shift in principle. Um, is there need to ask people what they need and we need to recognize that people hold all the solutions uh, we need to go out and figure out the solutions from those folks what got you guys started as an organization i mean how that how that happen that's always kind of an interesting story yeah so we started um you know it, at the time there wasn't really any big boom pow kind of event or anything that really led us down that not from a major catastrophic event um it started with conversations. We, we started just kind of having conversations around this stuff um, really at the local level, at the plant level, at the site level, um, with local leaders, with, with local with frontline employees. Uh, and it really, at the time, as I mentioned, we were very heavily invested in traditional safety. Um, so it kind of started these closed door meetings of, hey, let me tell you about this safety differently or new view kind of stuff kind of behind closed doors and it grew from there which was a little backwards than what we really expected it to be right it, that normal kind of change stuff you usually think about that manifesting in, at the top of the organization and kind of working its way down but for us it really started at the grassroots and kind of grew from there um, and really it was in and around certain sites or certain locations that were bright spots you know, just kind of grow those bright spots until eventually we got to the point of this really going enterprise wide. If you could give somebody a hint, like uh, lessons learned on sort of rolling out new view organizationally, what have you guys learned? What what's the what's the, the lever you pull to make this happen? For me, it's a lot of it. A lot of it is about just consistently talking about it, keeping it out in front, out in the open. Um, and I say that because we really recognized early on that if we wanted to really create sustainable and long-term change, we really had to target the underlying assumptions of the organization. That's really where we had to go. We couldn't just change our values. We couldn't just throw out some something and just expect things to change. Uh, and in particular, in and around our views on human error, right? As, as with most 
Um, we really, for the longest time, we viewed human error as a choice, and that really colored the way that we responded and reacted to not so great things happening. Um, so that was a huge shift for us uh, as we continue to talk about that and continue to educate uh, in and around air. Once we really got a change there, everything else changed. It was a total change from there. In the last podcast, the one we lost, <laughs> um, you talked about Shine's humble inquiry and you talked about organizational assumptions. And I do think that's really interesting that one of the assumptions that drives uh, really for the last probably 50 years safety management has been the assumption that error is a choice. Right. That's very interesting that that's a leverage point. How did you sell, I mean, how did you, how did you successfully get that out there? It was really the conversation. I mean, it, it, it was that. It was just conversation by conversation. I know that's a, a harder answer for some folks to hear. It wasn't really super strategic, but it was really going out and talking to folks and really making that make sense that, you know, folks that had these not so great things occur that if they really knew that the next step in this thing was going to be um, death, if they really knew that it was going to be some catastrophic outcome, they wouldn't have done it. And just continuing to drive that message home it's really how we started that. It really was that. It was the conversations. Have you had successes? Oh, for sure. Absolutely. So the one that I, I really think about um, was really one of the first ones. Uh, we had a, a site that had a really not so great uh, event occur. Um, and the way that we responded was vastly different. And it really had to do with the fact that we went out and we asked the site, you know, what, what's the feelings around this stuff? And surprisingly, or at the time surprisingly, folks were really concerned with metrics. They were really concerned with, is something reportable? They were really concerned with how that impacted metrics. And a lot of credit to the site manager there at the, the location I'm talking about that kind of set his world on fire. And he decided that was not going to, uh, that was just not going to work anymore. Um, and so we started down that path. And from there, that site was really a huge bright spot for us, rolling out learning teams and all kinds of other stuff. Uh, and one of those successes is, was really in and around this, this pump failure that they had more recently, uh, in which this group of frontline power plant employees come up with this amazing, amazing solution saying, you know, we can't really imagine all the hundreds of thousands of ways that a pump will fail. So we need to really shift our thinking from if this pump fails to when, and how do we make sure that when that pump fails that people don't die? Uh, because the, the event that they had, the, an employee was narrowly missed by a piece of this pump. So it was a really interesting to see at that level employees thinking in that direction. So to me, that was really super successful. How are you supporting management? Um, and did we just miss the airport? I, I think we did, actually. I think I'm going to have to make the loop <laughs> back through. Um, but a lot of the ways that we're supporting them is really just in that being there, um, kind of being that dissenting voice is kind of where we've been for a while. We're really going out and asking them how they need to be supported right now because we I can't say that we completely know, um, but really where, where we're at, or where we have been is is being a dissenting voice. You know, when we see something that doesn't make sense, we hear something that doesn't align with those uh, with those hot principles. Uh, we're kind of we've been that we've been saying, hey, we don't think this kind of jives. What do you think? Let's have a conversation about that. Uh, and really where we're at now is that. We're trying to ask them what they need. What type of support do they need? What do they need to know? Where do we need to go next? So tell me about your podcast. Why a podcast? Do you just think there's not enough in the world? <laughs> so there's probably way too many, I would probably say. Um, but for me, it really started as a fun thing, kind of going out, just wanting to wanting to do this, wanting to play with it. Um, and so what it's really turned into for me is a way to maybe inspire other safety professionals folks that are out there to maybe go down this path to share information. I think what's super cool to me is I, I learn way more than I really put out, which is kind of kind of cool. Oh, that's cool. That's very cool. Yeah. Are you are you interviewing people? What are you doing? I am. So I've had a few folks on, most, mostly other safety professionals. Um, and so it's, it's been super cool. It's been super Do they cool. like being on it? Do you get a lot of pushback? No. So what's really neat is I've had folks on there from kind of all over the spectrum so far of hop and understanding. Um, so, no, not a lot of pushback on the folks that have not really been exposed to it. It's more curiosity, which is good. That, that's a good thing. Yeah, I think so. I mean, I think the idea you're doing a podcast, I think more is better. Why not? M more people, it's, it's great. Any way we can get people talking, and it's a good way to get them talking. And it's kind of fun. I mean, you enjoying it? Absolutely. It's, it is such a blast 
just to have those conversations. And again, that's where I found and, and we found a lot of success within the organization is just having conversations. So I thought, what a cool way to kind of do that and just spread that around and try to share that with other folks well outside of, of kind of where we're at. That's perfect. So last but not least, if you had any hints, tips, hints, what would you say? Just have the conversations. I mean, that is that is absolutely huge. Keep it out front. Um, when you're going out and you're talking to those uh, frontline leaders and, and those folks, um, again, just, just approach it with an understanding that some of this stuff is scary. It's way different. They've heard kind of the opposite of this for a really, really long time. So um, jump in. Don't be afraid to have the conversations. So what do you think? Pretty good conversation with Sam, wasn't it? I owe you an apology. I'm sorry the sound quality is so terrible. I, I promise you it was good, but then my computer ate the file. I'm not, blam- I'm, not t- I'm not blaming anybody, but I'm not taking the heat for it either. So there you go. So that is the podcast for today. We'll be back. Keep listening. Tell your friends. Thanks for subscribing. Like us on Facebook. I don't, I don't have that, but, I mean, it seems like that's something you should say. Until then, learn something new every single day. Have as much fun as you possibly can. And for goodness sakes, you guys, be safe.